What's going on guys? Today we got an awesome video. We're going to talk about some tips and advice you can use when you go on your residency interviews. Okay, so today we have Dennis over here. Uh, you've seen him on some of the previous videos, but we're going to go and just give you some tips and advice on how to approach your interviews. So we're gonna go ahead and start with just some background on our match statistics. Go ahead and start with Dennis. Ryan, I didn't I don't think I can match your level of enthusiasm here. This is <laughs> this I, I am pretty excited though. This is the first time Brian has invited me to a video formally. Mm -hmm. Normally it's kinda like last minute it's like hey you want to join a video but Brian today is formal decided, invitation decided to have a formal <laughs> invitation on my Outlook calendar. So I appreciate that Brian. Um, but you, you, you mentioned match statistics and, and I wanted to just kind of bring up that, you know, getting into residency isn't the hardest thing in the world, but, you know, it will take up a lot of your time and it will take up um, definitely a lot of your mental energy. Um, and so just be prepared for that. Um, you know, the statistics that Brian will talk about in a little bit may seem scary, but, you know, I think there's always options. Um, out for, for you out there regardless of kind of whatever your, your interests are. So um, Brian, you wanted to mention the, the specific statistics, right? And we, we can, I, I guess like the main thing is I'll go into a more detailed video, uh, a, a more detailed description of those statistics in a future video, but I think the general consensus for the most part is about 66% yep. matching rate PGY1s, I can't remember PGY2s, a little higher than that but uh, more so just like on our background, on what our match statistics were. Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, I did my PGY1 residency out in Indiana University Health. Um, my PGY2 informatics out at the L State University works to Medical Center. Um, out of my P4 year in pharmacy school, I actually applied to seven programs, um, interviewed with five of them and matched my number one choice. Um, in my PGY2, I, I um, applied for also seven programs and I believe I interviewed for six in match my number one choice. So um, it's interesting that the discussion about how much you apply to because you know for everyone you apply to you gotta have a personal statement, it's a lot of work. So mm -hmm. uh, like how many did, did you apply to? Uh, so, okay. Dennis has way better statistics than I do. Uh, PGY1, I applied to seven programs. Yep. I only got three interviews, um, and I obviously didn't match my number one choice. I scrambled for my PGY-1. For PGY-2, I applied to seven programs. I got all seven interviews, but I declined one, and I didn't match my first choice. But but in terms of the absolute number, I think you know a lot of people have asked me kind of what the question, what number would be, and I personally feel like if you're over eight, that's too many for applications. I don't know. What do you yeah, think? Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, I kind of like think about. I would say experience. seven Seven's is also good. a lot too. Seven is a lot. <laughs> I mean, I applied to seven, and then I cannot. I could not fly to all seven because it was right. all in February. You know, that's too much stress. Yeah. Um, the most I heard was actually one of our classmates. I think it was like twenty or twenty-five. She only got one interview. <laughs> So well, because they probably copy and pasted every personal statement because you can't write 20 unique personal statements. Absolutely, you got to personalize that. Yeah. But, um, okay, so moving on, let's talk about just like some general things, very basic things, and there's like two points I want to convey, just like your general competition. So I know you have some points you want to mention. The points that I want to convey is like, number one, the number of spots, uh, let's say there's four spots for PGY1. Typically a program, at least what I've seen, anecdotal, uh, is that the program will invite four times, roughly four times, the number of candidates to call out to interview. So if there's four, about 16, give or take, two, three, four, whatever it may be. Um, so that's one point I want to convey. And then th the applicant pool usually can go up to like 100 to 200, so it's a lot of people applying to the program. And then the second point I want to talk about is that it really is, at least in how I consider it, is a level playing field. Once you're invited there, it doesn't really matter. You don't compare GPAs at that point. You don't compare um, your clinical rotations. It's how you interview, how you fit the program. The fit is really, really important. So those, like, those are the two points I want to kind of um, convey about the general competition to expect. Yeah, I would agree. I would think once you get into your interview, really nothing else about your application matters at that point. You, you can do 
you know, absolutely incredible on your application, but if you bomb your interview, that's it. Um, um, vice versa, if you were probably lower on the list, but they invited you and you just rock on your interview, that, that actually makes you, you know, one of your, the top candidates for this program. So the interview is really important once you get that interview. But you know, all the, all the steps leading up to it, obviously this video is gonna come out after, I think most people will either hear back or after application deadlines are, have you know, passed. So at this point, you're looking for interviews or you've accepted interviews. And yeah, I agree with those points that you know, the, once you get in, that interview is essential for, for, for your residency. Um, and so kind of in addition to my background as a former resident, um, two years, I also currently do interviews for our program here. And so I have a little idea of kind of how most programs certainly our program um, would try to fill those spots and I would say generally around four to five per spot is accurate especially for a PGY1. Those numbers skew a little bit differently once you get to PGY2 but um, obviously the applicant pool is also smaller for PGY2s as well. Um, kind of what I've seen is that most programs depending on the size will have somewhere between three to six or seven waves of interviews and each wave generally has probably you know between three to five people in that wave, and so obviously it depends on the number of spots that are available. Bigger programs are going to have a much bigger um, number of applicants and potentially more applicants on a single day. I think one of my interview sessions there was like six of us in one day. So PGY one know. or PGY two? PGY one. Yeah. Yeah. The most I think I had was six or seven. The least was probably like one or two. Yep. But I, again, it depends on the program size. Yep. If we have time, we're going to talk pro, pro cons of that because I have strong opinions about <laughs> strategies in those situations. Two is not always better than seven. <laughs> okay. Well, we can probably talk about that. Yeah. Let's see. Make sure the camera doesn't die. Uh, so, let's switch into some of the content that we can talk about in terms of like concrete advice we can give in certain. Um, Area. So one area is like the type of questions you might expect. Another area is about your CV. And I think these are all points that you should like be preparing for yeah. in one way or another. So questions, different questions, obviously. Your CV would be another area. And then the other one is an obvious one, researching the program itself. So we're going to talk about these three areas. And we're going to have a little free for all at the end about some other random miscellaneous topics. So starting with questions, obviously you're going to be asked questions on the interview. And we want to talk a little, a little bit about the types of questions because I think it's unique. Some of the questions that you get asked, and I guess we can kind of do it like, you know, you can give some advice on whatever you want to say about the types of questions or advice, and I'll just we'll just go back and forth like one or two things about whatever we want to say. Uh, so the first thing I'll say is that they ask a lot of like situ. Well, let's let's start with behavioral. I like the behavioral questions. They ask a lot of behavioral questions, and I think this, these were some of the more difficult questions for me. And the reason why is because they always ask about a difficult time, and it's always about how you work with others. So, for example, they always say, like, I don't know, give me a time when uh, some team member of yours didn't perform up to standards. What did you do? And the reason why I think a lot of it was a struggle was because I didn't have a lot of those experiences. You know, so. The, the reason why I'm bringing this up is you should come up with stories. And I think you're going to talk about that too. But like stories, think about things that occurred during rotations, pharmacy school, internships, whatever it may be, and um, try to answer it with those stories. Those are the best way. So, yeah. And so that's a good point. I think you know there there's this maybe like you know saying out there that says you know show don't tell. Um, don't tell them that you have you know, great attention to detail. Don't tell them that, oh, you're, you're excellent in, in management of sepsis. You know, give them an example. Um, being a P4 on your rotations, it, one of my preceptors taught me this trick. If you, thought, if you go through a day and you encounter something unique, something special that you've done or you've seen, Mark that down in, in a notebook or something like that. It's good. And those become the basis of how you will answer questions. Now, if you pick among all of those questions, all those scenarios, think about what questions they might fit. So if it's a stressful situation, make sure you have your stories down packed for one day ask you, which they will, 
give me an example of how you handle a stressful situation, or if you dealt, or a specific scenario that you remember of dealing with a difficult coworker. If they're going to ask you these questions. You can find a million of them on interviews, interview questions out there on Google. I mean, they're going to ask you behavioral or situational based questions. Um, kind of the unique thing that I had a lot in my interviews was not necessarily situational, which obviously we can all prepare for, get those stories out there, but kind of role playing. So like, okay, pretend you are now the pharmacist, you know, on rounds, and then you have a doctor recommend this in this situation, you know, tell me, show me how you would, you know, react in this situation. And those, you know, you can't rely on your crutches, which are your stories that you have based on your experiences. You have to really be creative. And those are the ones that are, for me, a little more challenging to answer. I don't know if you got a lot of those or not. I think it was only like one or two programs that had it. And then they, honestly, I think they were a little easy. I got interviewed basically by two ICU pharmacists and they just walked, pretend you're a pharmacist. Uh, here's a patient case, it was like, has asthma. Okay, what would be your first line treatment? What happens if they're not compliant? Or what happens if they have this side effect? Like, what are the routes you would go down? Um, I thought they were a little, they went a little easy. I mean, sounds like you had <laughs> more difficult questions. <laughs> My clinical questions have always been very easy. And to be honest, most of them have been either examinations, like actually like doing calculations or doing multiple choice, um, or computer-based tests. Those are the most common. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of clinical questions, just know your guidelines. It's pretty straightforward. No one's going to ask you to diagnose like Guillain Barre and, and the patient needs <laughs> IVIG or something crazy. You know, you're going to use sepsis, you're going to do anti coag, you're going to do hyperlipidemia, you're going to do diabetes. Yeah, period. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, piggyback on that question and maybe you just talked about it a little bit. But like, what would be your recommendation on like what to study? Like, there's so many guidelines out there, so many different disease states. Like, what was your. Um, kind of like decision making, which ones to study? So I can give you my answer as a as an applicant candidate, then I can give you my answer as an interviewer. As an applicant candidate, I tried to study my guidelines because everyone, all my preceptors told me that guidelines are what they're going to ask you, you know, if you're not going to get a crazy case um, that, that you have no foundational knowledge on. It's going to be stuff that you've learned in pharmacy school to one extent or Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, but as an interviewer, to be honest, you know, all of those, all of those questions that they ask you have points and they're ranked, you know, that's how they score you. Um, but for me, i rather a person be honest about not knowing, but then walk through the thought process. So it's not necessarily your answer to the question, but it's how you answer it. So if you truly don't know and you get truly stumped on a question, don't be wrong. <laughs> don't be wrong. That's the most important part. But you can say you don't know, you can say how you would find out. So sources of information. I would look up this particular guideline, which I just happened to not remember. I would look up Google Scholar or PubMed. I would look up up to date Wikipedia, you know. <laughs> um, but you know, how you would go about getting the answer. Because us as pharmacists, we don't always know the answers. So I if you don't know Tell them how you would find out. If you definitely don't, definitely don't tell them anything that's wrong. Being wrong and being confidently wrong is worse <laughs> than not knowing. <laughs> uh, two things on that. Uh, completely agree with that. I think confidence is also important. Like you don't want to be like uh, whatever or stumbling through your words. You want to be confident. Like you know what? I don't know. You know, but this is how I would approach this question. And certainly the thought process is so important. And the second thing I thought you brought up that was really good, and I forgot that I actually did it, was like going back to the little things that you jot down along the way. I started like a rolling Google Doc on every single rotation of every single thing I did. And I'll go back and talk about those stories and you know, just use those as the basis. Because you forget. There's so many things you do on rotation that you forget. So that's why I did. I kept a running list of it on a Google Doc. Um, okay, anything else about questions per se? You want to move on? What else you got? <laughs> um, I don't know. Let me see. If, was there any weird things that they were? Well, let's 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 leave that for the miscellaneous. There's some other. There, there are weird there's, things. There's all weird things. Let's, there's a lot of weird let's, things. Let's save that. That should be the basis for most types of questioning. Let's let's talk about like the CV. Like, what was your experience? Like, why? 
well, maybe you, you agree or don't agree. I think it's important that you review the experiences you've had on your CV. Um, do you agree or not? Absolutely. Okay. So as an interviewer, if it's on your CV, it's fair game for me to ask. So things to leave out, non-pharmacy related experiences. <laughs> um, if they're not related to pharmacy, I don't care if you worked at Publix for 10 years of your life, Florida people will know, <laughs> pub subs are the bomb. Yes. But, you know, doesn't matter. But if you put a poster or a presentation on there, that is free game for a question. And if you don't know anything about that poster or you don't remember, it's probably a good idea to exclude it. Um, you know, part of that is if you don't remember, clearly it wasn't, you know, a big enough, you know, project in your life and your education. Two, it looks really bad when you can't <laughs> answer the question on your CV. Yeah. So before you go to your interview, delete everything you cannot answer with more than a at least, you know, couple of sentences. Um, something to speak to. Can't be a one word answer. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, CV, everything on your CV is important. Everything is fair game. And me as an interviewer, I would ask about it. Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll say a couple of things uh, and then you see if like, there's anything you want to piggyback off of. So completely agree, obviously. That's why I'm talking about why we want to review your CV. You definitely should know your experiences. I know for myself, like the presentations I did, the projects I did, I did go back and actually look up the statistics. like. Uh, what did I do on this project? Was there any statistics that came from it? What was the outcome that came from it? So I was able to speak on it. Something else, um, I don't know how you feel about this. I don't remember if I did it. I think I did it. Oh, I did it. That's right, I did it. So what was cool though, so a lot of people, when I was asking them about the CV, they would say, obviously study your CV. And they said to go a step further, to print them all out, like presentations, journal clubs, projects. I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna do that. What I did, I copied you and I did like, I did a website and I loaded all the presentations on yes. there. So I brought an iPad to my presentations and I had them downloaded. And they were like, they were blown away by that. That was fantastic. That's what I did. So I think you that that whole process kind of takes it to a different level of how to stand out amongst your group of people you're interviewing with. I don't think any program out there will expect you to have all your content. Completely agree. But if you're able to impress them with that, you stand out. Now they're standing out in a good way and you're standing out in a bad way. I mean, that is standing out in a good way. That you have that and they can look at it, they can review it, they can see the quality of your work. It is important. Um, I did have a flash drive on me at all mm -hmm. times of all my stuff if I needed to pull it up. But I. I mean, obviously my website, which not everyone will have, but I do recommend it. Um, my website had a lot of stuff and it was on my CV so they can go on the website and check out the stuff. But I also had a flash drive I mean, with, my, I think with that my backups of all my Dropbox stuff. In terms of like the more feasible approach for the majority of the viewers, yeah. that's actually a really good idea yeah. to simply just load everything to a drop. That's, that's good. Loading everything to a flash drive. Now, that's dangerous because if they ask you to present on something <laughs> you don't remember how to present on it, the you will story. fail. <laughs> I wonder, have you heard? I don't remember if I've heard people having to do that, like just present on something. Well, so we can talk about kind of the presentations and some of the other weird stuff that okay, you do. Yeah. You know, that kind of is a nice segue, but you know, most places want you to just reuse a presentation. You're not going to have Please present on sepsis. Yeah, they're gonna say, give us a presentation, whatever it might be. So that's an opportunity for you to really shine, but you really have to know that presentation well. Um, I haven't heard of any place to be like on the spot. Hey, give us a presentation. Like, oh boy, I have to create one or pull up from scratch or pull up from a previous one. I haven't heard that yet. Okay. I think that would be really unfair because, <laughs> like, honestly, I have given presentations that if I try to give now with no preparation. I would just completely sputter throughout the whole thing. So, yeah. um, okay. but you know, if you take that risk of carrying your stuff and you take the risk of having someone potentially see it, you better know it. <laughs> uh, let's let's transition over to the third part, which is like about a very obvious researching the program. Like, there's obviously a lot of things you can research. Um, I'll let you kind of start first in this one. What are some things you would recommend to research? What what about the program? So why do we do research? It's because you have that awkward five to ten minutes at the ever, end of every interview for what questions you have. 
So what questions do you have for us? If you ask a dumb question, it makes you look dumb. That's the honest truth. So have good questions. How do you have good questions? Um, my way has always been the stalker way. Like be the biggest stalker you can be. Um, and what I mean by that is most programs usually give you a list of who you'll be interviewing with. Typically those people are you know, high on some kind of ladder in the organization, whether they're actual preceptors or they've been there a long time. And if they're, they've done those things, they're probably published or they're probably somewhere out on the Googles and the PubMeds of the world. Mm -hmm. Find out what they're interested in. Um, you know, you can't just ask administrative things about the program. Oh, how often do I staff? Or what kind of, what's my staffing like? Ask real questions that are articulate and show that you have a true interest and a vested interest in, res in researching the program. So what I've done is I always looked at what, you know, what the current residents that they have precepted to or either are working on for that particular interviewer. So if they're doing some project, uh, or was asked about that project, oh, can I get involved, or is that something I have opportunity to, to do while I'm here as a resident? Um, people, you know, kind of do like when, when you look them up. <laughs> um, it, it puts you in a different place, because I would say that most candidates don't go to that length. And it's another kind of one of those things, along with having all your, you know, contacts, you know, making you stand out in a good way versus a bad way. I don't know, did you do that same thing? I did, and I think it, it's nice to set how you separate it. I think there's a bare minimum of what you should do, and obviously you research the program for the bare minimum to not ask dumb questions like, oh, do you guys have teaching certificates? It's obvious that they do. But Don't ask a question that is on the resident website. So those are, I would consider, bare minimum, yes. right? And I think, you know, going to your point about, like, taking it a step further, I think it's also uh, with different programs' expectations. I actually learned this from Ryan. So I did only because of Ryan. So I took, you know, going back to your point, they usually provide you a list of interviewers. You know, you know who they are. I stalk them. Yes, I did. You look up all their research on PubMed to see if they have any. They do love it. And what was surprising to me, most students, I would say, yes, they don't do it. So I think it's going above and beyond. Except when Ryan was talking to me about it, he said it's expected in admin programs. And I thought that was interesting. Or maybe I'm completely wrong. I just remember hearing that. And I was like, really? So they, he was saying like, it's pretty cutthroat where like, you should be expected to know everything about this program you're interviewing with. You know, like all those people like, oh yeah, I remember you did this blah, blah, blah research in like 1982, whatever it may be. But yeah, I did it and I think it really helps you shine. You don't throw it out there. I think it's situational. Yeah. You don't, you know, <laughs> when, when it comes up, they, they might talk about it. I was like, oh yeah, like you, I, I loved your research <laughs> back in like 1990. And that, that impresses people. And I did that only a handful of times because you don't always bring it up. I, I agree, you don't always want to bring it up because it, it kind of seems stalkerish. Yeah. Even though you need to be stalkerish. It, for me, I always use it as a crutch when you need to fill additional minutes at the end. Say you have 10 minutes of questions and you only have six, like five minutes worth of questions. Like, all right, we need to throw something out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my opinion is that you should fill up that time. You can't just say, oh, yeah, I got no more questions. <laughs> I'm good. Um, try to fill up that time. It just makes it a better conversation, in my opinion. I think another thing to add to this point in terms of like researching, aside from just researching the different interviewers, um, is to also look at, I mean, you're obviously looking at what they did. They will sometimes have a particular interest, like I remember in one of the programs I interviewed for, they were infectious disease pharmacists, they did a lot of infectious disease research. I was like, hmm, I should maybe know a little bit about infectious disease and some of the research and just study up on those different areas. I think that helps guide some of those conversations because they might ask you a question about their research or something, if you bring it up too. Um, okay, was there anything else about program research? No, just be a stalker, find out who you're talking to. Um, know a lot about them as much as you can. Okay. Don't ask questions that are on the website. Yes, bare minimum. You must know their, you should know their website in and out. That's really important. Okay, let's talk about like the miscellaneous market. Just like random things, tips, advice, or just things to be aware of. Uh, just let you start, whatever, whatever you want to talk about. Uh, I had a lot more weirder interview situations in my PGY1 than my PGY2. Like they're just off the charts weird. Um, you know, in terms of 
you know, programs wanted to, obviously these programs wanted to differentiate candidates in a very specific way. PGY1s get a ton of candidates, so they need a way to, to really differentiate amongst them other than just clinical questions because, you know, people are teachable even though they don't necessarily know the content right away. So I think that's why a lot of these programs did some of these things, but I was in situations where like one organization, I was, you know, placed in a group team, team building experience and all the preceptors sat around us and watched us interact in a non-pharmacy related scenario. I think it was like surviving on a desert beach and you get like six items and you know, what, how would you get out or something? The Coliseum. You know, so, you know, in those situations, they're gauging you know, whether this person would be a leader, whether they would follow, whether they would recommend something if someone says something clearly wrong. I mean, so that's one of my weirder ones. I don't know if you had. Well, that's because his camera died. Yes, the camera died. Sony A6300, 30, 30 minutes. When you film on it for 30 minutes before it dies. Uh, okay, so let's see a weird one. Um, you know, the weirdest one I heard of, I wasn't involved in it, but it seems pretty commonplace, was that they would have all the PGY1 residents come into a big auditorium and they play Jeopardy. So I think that is so stressful because you obviously are answering in front of everyone. And all the preceptors are there, obviously. Everyone is there. It's a big auditorium. It's almost like therapy class where you stand in front of the room and you answer. They get a mic, yeah, yeah. you know, and they, they answer. And so like people, people say they, they have like nervous breakdowns. You have a mic, you don't know what to say. <laughs> that, I think that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. But um, that was probably the weirdest one I've heard of. Um, any anything else? I mean, there's we talked about like, some of the just like other random stuff that you might encounter. I mean, I had one where it was like a roll of six different interviewers, and they all had a situational role playing question. You know, one I, I had to like console a mom that just lost her baby or something like that, and I was like, that's not even a pharmacist's job. But I think what I think the point of what they're trying to do is, you know, one, gauging how you react on your feet for a question that you have no preparation for. Um, and then obviously the patient, you know, um, dealing with patients that either might be stressed out or difficult. So, you know, a lot of these have intents and I know why they do it. They need to differentiate amongst candidates. But some of them, I wouldn't say maybe weird isn't the right word, but they're just not something you can prepare for. And so you know, part of the interview process will have a lot of these, I would say. Um, maybe not at every institution, but certainly those will come up. I mean, there's nothing you can do about them, but just be prepared for the possibility <laughs> of some of these things that come out. Go, going along those lines, I think there's a lot of things you can study that are situational cases when you bring it out. So for example, uh, many of these interviews in PGY1 and probably PGY2 is they usually have you interview with a clinical group of folks and then an administrative group of folks. I think one of the things that I thought was really helpful and it coincidentally came out during our year was studying the pharmacy forecast. Um, when talking to the group of administrators, there was a couple interviews where it was a panel of administrators and then also the candidates. I didn't like that. You know, it was kind of odd, but they would bring up obviously pharmacy practice things, big issues. Like right now we have 340B like being talked about left and right. It would impress administrators if you have some knowledge of 340B. And if you can read current literature, pharmacy forecast just came out, the 2018 one, and it talks a lot about 340B. So I think that's one of those things I think you can study up ahead of. And that, that, that could be another thing that is good, help you out, you know. I remember distinctly reading pharmacy forecasts before one of my interviews and I find pharmacy forecasts as a source of kind of questions to ask of where an organization is going or what their level of pharmacy practice might be and so you know where are pharmacists involved where they're not where will where will they be involved you know things like that and, and you're right there are distinct groups of individuals that you interview with which is why looking to the list of interviewers is really important to understand who those individuals are, um, the position, title, etc. Because you don't necessarily want to ask a clinical 
person, a very administrative type question that they might not have any involvement in. Just kind of, you know, there's, they can probably answer it, but you know, they probably prefer not to, you know. So it's important that list. Uh, two other things that I would say, and you can kind of prepare for it, is like on one of my interviews for PGY One, I had to do a journal club. Ooh. So it was it was kind of weird. So what it was perfect in a sense. I didn't tell them this obviously, but uh, they give you the journal club one week in advance. I think they rotate articles, so they, you can't know ahead of time what you can do. So they give you the article ahead of time. You can obviously research it, read it, and work it up. Um, they gave me Callistin, <laughs> and at that time I just finished doing a research project on it. Yeah, so I and this is what I would recommend to others. Obviously, if you know your journal club skills, you don't just read that article. You have to know the breadth of literature out there. So I did, and I think that's what made the interview go well. Is because you don't just talk about that article. You talk about everything else that's out there. So journal club is something that I had, and then the. Uh, what's that other weird one that I had? Uh, presentation. I think of a presentation. I thought it was really unique. And this was probably my best presentation oh, I, I gave. Oh, I a lot. A feature I won? Oh, you, yeah. you, you did. I did it. I had a very easy one. So I had to give a five, and they, they purposely did it this way, I found out afterwards. I had to give a five minute presentation about myself. Like, how easy is that? Five minutes about yourself. No structure, no format. You can do whatever you want. All they said is, give a five minute presentation about yourself. And I did that with a, a PowerPoint. So I'll probably share that at some future video, but that's the only presentation I did on PGY1. I did a lot of PGY2, but not PGY1. I think I had to do something about like three or four presentations in my PGY1. PGY1. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on where you go. I mean, obviously, every interview cycle will be a little bit different. Yeah. yeah. But I think you brought up a point, you know, Journal Club, you probably did that with other people that are interviewing that day, right? Yeah. So, here's my, my take on that. If you are interviewing with only one other person, the only person you have to be better than is that person that you're interviewing with um, of that day. Because as an interviewer, as a program, you kind of think of people in terms of the days that they interview. So, um, it, it is to your benefit um, to actually have less people in your interview group because then you only have to be better than one person. <laughs> but if you're in a group of like seven people, like me as an interviewer, me as a program, you know, I try to, I, I catch myself doing it, but you know, I tend to think of them in terms of the days and, and of all the people that I interviewed that particular day. It's hard to be better than like six other people, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and especially if you're in a journal club situation or if you're in a group situation, it's really hard to like shine. But at the other, on the other end of it, if you're not that great at interviewing, it's one other person that you're interviewing with, you can very easily look very bad compared to that one person. So, you know, if you're not a great interviewer, you, you may serve you better being in a group where you kind of get lost. I don't know if that makes any sense or if you agree. <laughs> I agree with that. Um... I don't know what you can really do about it. You can, I don't know that you can do much about it, but just kind of be aware of how something like that can be perceived. Yeah. I mean, I think I would be biased too if I saw two or three, however many, if it was more than one candidate, the one who obviously shines would be the one that sticks out in my mind. And obviously I would consider them superior in that sense. So, I mean, I think the other thing just in general is to emphasize being confident on interviews. Yeah, everyone's nervous, but um, and I think the slightly arrogant might be okay. Not not arrogant, but <laughs> slightly, just a sliver of it. You want to know what you're talking about, but also be confident to say you don't. When you don't, you say you don't, because they will call. <laughs> that will look bad if you say something wrong. But know know what you know and know what you don't know is is kind of what I've been taught. Yeah. Um, you know, definitely be very clear when you don't fully understand something or you need clarification. Um, be clear about that. But what you do know, you need to say with confidence, um, without hesitation, without kind of stuttering, things like that, if you can avoid it. Now, obviously, everyone has kind of those ticks. I do too. I use um a lot. Um, and I say um, 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 um when I'm thinking. 
Um, but you, those are things that you can practice on, kind of avoiding, you know, those those verbal crutches to kind of get you through the next thought. Um, but you know, definitely don't be wrong. <laughs> it's okay to not know, but it's not really that okay to be wrong. I don't so. even know how you would tell someone to improve their confidence or like how you can Im improve that at all. I don't know that it's it's improving their confidence. It's improving the interview ability you know um, confident you know you can you can have confidence in your knowledge but you cannot show it in your interview if you're nervous or if you display mm -hmm. so body language is important too you know how you convey information so if you have body language that shows like you're not really sure you're uncertain about what you're saying you may be very well know what you're talking about but you don't it doesn't come across that way so that's why I don't know if confidence or arrogance is really the word, but it's more of like interviewing skills. It's overall your soft skills, interviewing skills. Yeah. I think something else that I would say that would be helpful and what was bad for me was that I was very nervous for my first year interviews and I memorized a lot of stuff, which was really bad because you obviously have like elevator pitches for like, tell me about yourself. <laughs> What are your strengths and weaknesses? And I literally memorized it. It came out horrible, not natural, very uncomfortable. Uh, I came off nervous when I forget what I was supposed to say. That was the worst interviewing experience I had. Um, so that's one thing to do is not memorize and just kind of practice. Let it be natural. Yeah, just yeah. let it be natural. Um, and then the second thing is like Amy Cudden, Cudgen? I don't remember her name. But she has a TED talk on it. She says the power poses, the power poses work. You know, like going into interviews and being in like power poses. And you power pose right now, Brian? Yeah, you, you go like power pose. Show me a power pose. Kind of thing like that. But like yeah. versus like a, a pose, it, her research showed that, you know, the levels of cortisol, which stress, I think it decreased. So you were more confident in that sense, but it was research shown and it worked for me. I did it on an MCAT. <laughs> I did well. You're confident in yourself. You want to be more enthusiastic. I, I think I think power moves. Power is it power moves? Power poses. <laughs> wow. He's good. I think you need to review the TED talk. I don't remember. It's a long time ago. <laughs> but uh, okay, that I'll kind of wrap that up. Is there any last last kind of advice you would give uh, the folks? You know, I had something in my mind, but I don't remember what it is right now. But what about you? Let's see if I think about it between the time you finish up and. <laughs> I'll say one thing, and again, everything I learned, I feel like, from interviewing is from Ryan. He he taught me this trick. He's gonna and love he, this video. He you should send this video to him. He watched. I remember he watched one of them because I called him out on it. A uh, good way, but uh, this this one, I'll send it to him. He said, and I did use it too. So the thing, <laughs> the thing he, he said that was really cool is like, programs like fit. Obviously, we want to mesh with the candidate, right? So he says he always does this hand motion. They like it when you do like. Uh, when you're talking to them, it's like, you know, I really like your program because I think, you know, we're great <laughs> And he pushes his hand together, like the visual, audio and visual. We're gonna wrap this video up. Uh, if you guys have questions, I'll leave Dennis's contact information below. And until next time, guys. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in and watching the video. If you like the content, definitely hit the Impro RX button over to your left to subscribe and definitely check out more videos over here uh, to your right. Now, as always, if you have questions, comments, and even better, suggestions for future videos, definitely let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, until next time guys.